Hey guys, so I wanted to do a video talking about this topic um, uh, that I, I think will be interesting. I think a lot of people will enjoy this and get a lot out of it. So when I was a kid in school, we were taught, okay, this is how a fossil forms. And we were told in class um, and in the textbooks, okay, so you have an animal that um, dies and slowly gets buried. Um, you know, very slowly over the course of, you know, a long period of time. And then gradually over millions of years, it turns into a fossil. So perhaps you have a fish swimming around in the water and um, one day the fish dies. Uh, maybe it didn't get enough food to eat or maybe it got sick or maybe it just got old and it died. Um, and then we're told, okay, then that fish, you know, sinks to the bottom of the water and slowly gets buried by the sediment. Um, and then, of course, after millions of years, you know, becomes something like this. You know, a perfectly preserved, um, why is this not showing up very well? Okay, so a very, very well-preserved um, fossil of a fish. Now, this one right here is a plastic fossil of a fish that um, costs a lot less money than a real fossil. So, this one here is a piece of plastic. Um, but... The model kind of gives you the idea. Um, we see that the fins are very intact. We see that the body is very intact. Um, so you see something that is very, very well preserved. Um, now, what's the problem with this? Um, just on an objective basis, you know, never mind uh, what your worldview might be, or never mind um, whatever else you might believe about the world, never mind what you might believe about how old fossils are, things like that. Um, what do we see right on the face of this um, that's a problem? Well, for one thing, when fish die, you know, they tend to float to the top of, you know, the surface of the water. If any of you have ever had pet fish before, whether it be a pet goldfish or, or any other kind of fish, uh, when that fish dies, they tend to float to the surface. Um, and if you have other things living in your fish tank or other things living in the pond, um, they'll tend to want to pick off, they'll tend to want to pick away at that carcass. Um, so by the time that carcass, you know, sinks down to the bottom of water, of the water to get buried, you don't have a lot of these like super intact features left. Um, you might have like a little bit of basically debris raining, raining down to the bottom of the water. And then that will get picked off by worms and little scavengers that live at the bottom of the water. Um, but when we look at fossils, they tend to be very well, a lot of them are very well preserved. A lot of them are uh, still very intact. Um, we see fossils of animals eating other animals. Um, there's at least one famous fossil of an ichthyosaur that's giving birth. Um, so what does that tell us? Um, what does that tell, what does that tell us? So basically the first thing that tells us is the typical explanation that we're all taught in school as kids, or at least that I was taught in school as a kid, doesn't make any sense. Um, now, I'm very big on science. I'm very pro-science, but your science has to follow from the data. Um, your science needs to follow from the facts. Um, if you're just making up stories that are, um, if you're just making up stories about the natural world, you're basically telling naturalistic fairy tales. Now, you might not have magic and wizards and things like that involved, but if you're just making up a story, then it's basically a fairy tale. It's not science. So one thing I want to talk about in this video um, is clam fossils. You know, so I've got a couple of clam fossils here that are very, very well preserved. Like It almost looks like a, you know, a clam at a beach. So I was, when I ordered these and got these... Uh, online and they they came to me i was amazed by how well preserved they are um and i also got some other ones that are you know not quite as pretty but you know you can still see that um you can still see them you can still see that you know it's it's a fossilized clam um now what's the problem with this what do we see in terms of what we can actually observe with this clam um, if you want to tell me this clam was buried slowly and gradually after it died, um, 
there's there's definitely some issues here. Now, I want to give people a chance to look at this and kind of think it over. Um, think about what is up with this clam and try to come up with some ideas for yourself. Um, so we see this clam here, and this clam is intact. It's very well preserved. Um, it looks like it looks almost like it's alive. Um, but what happens when you go to a restaurant and you order, you put in an order of clams and they come and serve the clams to you? Um, how does this look different? Well, basically, this clam right here is closed. Um, now, when clams die, their shells actually open up. And that's why when you go to a restaurant and they cook clams, they cook clams for you, um, when they put the clams in to be cooked, usually those shells are closed, at least from, from what I've seen of people cooking clams. I'll definitely admit I'm not a seafood chef. But you see that these clams, they're closed when they go to cook them. Yep, somebody said closed in the, in the comments there. Um, but then after you steam them or cook them in whatever way, they tend to open up. And this is what happens when you go to the beach. When you go to the beach and you see um, oyster shells or clam shells, um, you'll see that the ones that are dead are open. And usually they're, they're pretty clean because the uh, different scavengers have picked away at the meat and picked away at you know, the inside part of it. So what you have is basically a half shell that's open up or maybe a full shell that's open up. So based on that, based on that observation, what can we conclude about a clam fossil that's closed? Um, and basically what you can conclude is that this fossil was buried uh, while this clam was still alive. So this clam wasn't sitting there you know, going about its business, um, you know, doing clam stuff, and then died, and then was slowly and gradually buried. No, this this clam was buried alive. Um, and some of you will say, well, so what? You know, what's what's the big deal about a clam being buried alive? What's the big deal about fish being buried alive and dinosaurs being buried alive? Um, well, at, at first it might not seem a big deal, but there's there's a lot of implications here. Um, like I said, typically in textbooks, you're told that animals are buried slowly and gradually. And this comes from a philosophy in science, um, in the history of geology called uniformitarianism. And it's this idea that, um, everything happens very slowly, very gradually, um, that there are never cataclysmic events. So cataclysmic events don't happen. Um, now that philosophy was really challenged in the 1980s with Mount St. Helens, which kind of blew that idea away. Um, but before that, this, and even today, this philosophy that, oh, well, cataclysmic events don't happen, which is really basically just a presupposition. Um, this was basically put out there in order to discredit the idea of Noah's flood. So in order to say, well, Noah's flood never happened, um, the earth is millions of years old, they just basically presupposed the idea of cataclysms away. They just said, well, cataclysms don't happen. Well, why? Well, because I said so. But when you look at the fossil record, you see a lot of evidence of animals buried alive. Um, so that itself does not prove Noah's flood, but it does prove that when you look at the fossil record and you see what's actually there, it does prove that things were buried catastrophically. Um, now, whether that was in one giant flood that covered the whole earth or whether it was in... Um, you know, smaller events that happened here and there, or a series of many different catastrophic events. Um, just based on looking at individual fossils, you might not be able to tell. So you might be able to say, okay, I know that there were some catastrophic events. I might not know how they happened. I might not know to what scale they happened. But you can definitely say the cataclysmic events occur. Um, this idea that you have to throw out Noah's flood and throw out cataclysmic events a priori and just assume that that never happened. Um, it, it's not scientific. It, it's not even good philosophy. It's just basically a just basically somebody saying, well, I want to believe this and I don't want to believe that. Or it's saying, I, I don't want to believe that, therefore it didn't happen. 
Um, and unfortunately, that's what you see a lot in science. Um, that's what you see a lot in geology and biology is you see um, this idea that, well, I want to believe this way, um, therefore this thing must be true. Um, and unfortunately, many people in the public, they just say, well, this really smart person on TV says and believes this, therefore it must be science, therefore it must be good science, therefore it must be true. But when you really examine the philosophy and you really look at the logic um, and you look at the arguments more carefully, a lot of these things start to break down. So that's a big part of you know what I want to say about clam fossils and uh, Noah's flood. So basically when you look at fossils, um, including fossilized clams, you could say, well, this animal is clearly buried alive. Um, this animal was alive when it was buried. Um, and you might be able to come up with uh, alternative explanations. Um, somebody might come up with some other explanation saying, well, yeah, this, this clam died, um, but here's why it didn't open up when it died. And that's something you always have to be open to in science, especially when you're talking about historical sciences, um, you know, science that addresses things that happened in the past. Um, you always have to be open to alternative explanations. You can't be so dogmatic and say, well, this is definitely what happened and we're not allowed to question it. Um, but when we look at the data and we look at all these different types of fossils that exist out there and we see widespread evidence of animals buried alive, um, we see evidence of a very, very good preservation, um, then it does show that um, the mainstream textbook explanation of what happened um, is not correct. We could say that it does not fit with the actual facts. Um, and that's something that, to keep in mind for Christian apologists too. Um, people will talk a lot about presupp different people having different presuppositions, um, but you can't just presuppose whatever you want. Um, you can't just say, well, I, I presuppose that there was never a global flood, therefore it didn't happen. Um, and you know that's that's a problem I have with with presuppositionalism, whether it be Christian presuppositionalism or whether it be secular presuppositionalism. Um, I, I think that what people have to do is they have to look at the facts and say, what well, can I objectively prove based on the facts? Now, this alone uh, does not prove, like I said, does not prove Noah's flood. Um, it does not disprove evolution because presumably. Um, uh, presumably you could have the concept of evolution uh, within a world that where cataclysmic events happen, um, perhaps even happen periodically. Um, so while evolution and catastrophism are not necessarily mutually exclusive, um, uniformitarianism, this idea that everything has to happen gradually and that there, there's no no uh, cataclysmic events, um, they definitely have a historical philosophical relationship. So anyway, that's my main message here is, you know, look at when you look at scientific claims, look at the philosophy, um, look at the logic of the arguments and say, do these follow? But then also look at the facts, look at the facts and say, hey, uh, what are the facts in this case? What can I actually prove based on the evidence? Um, and what can I reasonably conclude based on the evidence, even if I can't absolutely prove it, you know, to a scientific standard? And say, hey, uh, are there other explanations here? Are there other scientists who disagree and say something different? So um, I, I, th I think this is a... You know what? Let me know in the comments section if you think I explained this well. Um, let me know what you think about this video, and let me know if you have any questions for uh, other topics in the future. Um, for now, thanks for taking the time to watch this video. Uh, looks like I have three people watching this live, and four people watching this live, and uh, I've got two likes so far. So be sure to like, comment, and share. Um, and let me know what else you would like me to talk about, because um, I don't want this to be a typical... I don't want this to be like a YouTube channel that just goes, ha, 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 you know, this person over there is stupid, um, or ha, 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 look at what uh, this particular politician said. I want this to be a channel um, 
where I'm expressing ideas that are going to be valuable a hundred years from now. And that's the same with stuff I write. I want it to be valuable a hundred years from now. So please take the time to, uh, uh, take the time to like this video, comment and share. Thank you so much. And so I see, uh, somebody commented, good evening to my brother. Uh, good evening to you too. Um, and, uh, for the other person who commented close, uh, thank you so much for that. So I'm going to take the time to end this video. I might go live again tonight. I'm not sure yet, but thank you for watching this video. This is Greg out.